Before we delve into this video, a quick thank you is in order, firstly to you for watching and of course the following people for subscribing, liking our content and supporting us. We're nearly at 10k subscribers and I will continue doing similar shoutouts in future videos. A small click for you is indeed a huge leap for our channel. Thank you. The real Annabelle the doll is a reportedly haunted Raggedy Ann doll. It resides in a glass box at the Occult Museum in Monroe, Connecticut. The museum belongs to Ed and Lorraine Warren, the late paranormal investigators who took final possession of it for safekeeping in 1970. Beneath the glass case on which the doll sits runs the inscription, Warning, Positively Do Not Open. The warning alludes to the doll's mysterious legend, which separates it from other Raggedy Ann dolls produced in the mid-20th century. The legend tells of the doll's several hauntings and associates it with several cases of demonic possession, slews of violent attacks and some near-death experiences. These and other stories have since inspired several horror films, including The Conjuring Universe. Legend aside, what exactly is the real story behind Ed and Lorraine Warren regarding Annabelle the doll? Is the real Annabelle doll a vessel for a demonic spirit searching for a human host or simply a kid toy being used to profit within ghost stories? How did the Warrens first come across the doll and how did it eventually end up in their museum? By looks, the real life Annabelle the doll is scarcely a pictorial mirror of her cinematic counterpart. Whereas the cinematic image shows porcelain skin and other lifelike features, the real-life Annabelle doll actually appears ordinary in its appearance. This real Annabelle doll is what's known as a Raggedy Ann. This is a rag doll with red yarn for hair and a triangle nose. Their creator, Gruel, received a US patent D47789 for his Raggedy Ann doll on September 7, 1915. The character was created in 1915 as a doll and was introduced to the public in the 1918 book Raggedy Ann Stories. Unsurprising during a time when spiritualism and the occult were at some of the highest levels. Its stitched features, a guarded smile and a bright orange coloured nose remind one of the childhood toys back in the 1970s. Nevertheless, how did the Warrens first come across the doll and how did it eventually end up in their museum? Just a quick reminder before we continue to smash the thumbs up and subscribe if you'd like to see more content from our channel. It's not without good reason that there is a warning beneath the glass case housing the real-life Annabelle doll inside the Warrens Museum. The well-known paranormal investigators claim the doll was responsible for several tragic experiences, including two near-death experiences, a fatal accident and a string of demonic activities running for over 30 years. The Warrens trace the first of Annabelle's infamous hauntings back to 1970. Their repeatedly told account is that of the story they allegedly heard from two young women who were the first to possess the doll. The story is that the Annabelle doll was actually a birthday gift from a mother to a nurse daughter called Donna, or Daedra in some instances, depending on who you hear the story from. Trilled Donna took the gift with her to the apartment that she was sharing with Angie, another young nurse. Now initially, the doll sitting on the living room sofa was an adorable accessory, but then it eventually came to the notice of the two nurses that the doll seemingly had a knack for moving around the apartment by itself. If Donna left it on the living room sofa as she left for work, she would return later in the afternoon and find the doll in her bedroom, albeit with the door being shut. Before long, Donna and Angie would find notes written on parchment paper which by the way they never had in their home, left everywhere in their apartment reading, help me. Another time, Lo, Angie's boyfriend, was in the apartment one afternoon while Donna was out, when he heard rustling in her room, as though somebody or an animal had broken in. Lo, upon inspecting the room, could find no sign of forced entry. What he did find instead was the Annabelle doll, face down on the floor, once again seemingly having moved or been moved from where she had been initially. From here, accounts have since become somewhat blurry, with some versions of the story claiming that the Annabelle doll attacked Lo upon him waking up from a nap. One version maintains that upon feeling a searing chest pain, Lo found bloody claw marks running across his chest. 
the marks would vanish without a trace only two days later. Lowell's traumatic experience was the final straw for the two young nurses. At once, they invited a medium over to address what now seemed to show the hallmarks of a paranormal problem. The medium, following a seance, told the two young nurses that the spirit of a deceased seven-year-old girl called Annabelle Higgins inhabited the doll. They had found the deceased's body years earlier on the site, housing their apartment building. Apparently, the spirit was benevolent and simply wanted love and care. Naturally, being nurses, it's not hard to see why this would have appealed to their caring nature. Moved by the revelation, the two nurses reportedly consented to allow the spirit to keep permanent residence in the doll. Eventually, the two, Donna and Angie, would nonetheless look to read their apartment of the Annabelle doll spirit. They reached out to an Episcopal priest called Father Hegan, who himself contacted his superior, Father Cook. Then Father Cook alerted Ed and Lorraine Warren. Now the Warrens claimed they immediately noted signs of demonic possession, including teleportation, the doll being able to move on its own, materialization, apparent in the parchment paper, which the nurses claimed to have never kept in the house, notes, and the mark of the beast, the claws on Lowe's chest. Now, according to the Warrens, trouble began when the two young women started believing that the doll deserved their sympathy. What was inside Annabelle was not a benevolent soul, but a demonic force that was searching for a human horse soul. According to the Warrens, the spirit had manipulated the doll to create an illusion of living in order to be recognized. The spirit, the Warrens concluded, was not looking to stay attached to the doll, but was looking for the opportunity to possess a human host. The Warrens subsequently worked with Father Cook to perform an exorcism of the apartment as they took the Annabelle doll out of the apartment and to its restricted resting glass case in which it lives to this very day at the Occult Museum. The eccentric collection surrounding Annabelle contains everything from an alleged vampire's coffin to a child's tombstone used as a satanic altar, amongst others. That, the Warrens had hoped, would end her demonic reign. The question is, did it? With both Lorraine and Ed having passed away, their daughter Judy and husband Tony Spera, whom the Warrens mentored as their demonology protégés, are carrying on their legacy. Judy and Spera today care for the artifacts including the Annabelle doll, and her protective glass case inside the Occult Museum in Monroe, Connecticut, USA. And by the way, the antics by the doll, which we've covered in this video, are just the tip of the evil iceberg. Take for example, a priest from Hartford, who once visited the Warrens' home and threw the doll across the room, proclaiming that God was more powerful than the devil. On his way back to the rectory, he got into a serious accident with a tractor trailer. Not to mention when decades ago a museum visitor ignored the obvious warnings and banged on the doll's box. It was reported that it died in a motorcycle crash shortly after. Prayers are regularly done by a priest to bless the area in the room where the doll is kept. Now to never miss out on our future content, hit the like and subscribe button, turning on all notifications. Check out the video on screen for more content we know you'll enjoy. Thank you for watching, we'll see you soon.